name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Your Excellency, Reverend Father Rector, dear friends, we see today's ruler completely desperate, rushing to this master, this teacher, a last resort, perhaps he can save my daughter, his little daughter, almost 12 years old, whether she's at the point of death or has already expired, we have a man in desperate straits, true urgency coming upon our Lord, and he does something that is all things considered, astounding. Something that bears a profound lesson for us. Because what he does, we forget to do in much less excusable circumstances. If anyone would be justified in forgetting this, neglecting this, it would be this broken man brought to his knees as he helplessly, helplessly watches this precious life slip away. And yet, what does he do that we, we forget to do? He comes to our Lord, and before he says anything, Adoravit, he adored. It's remarkable. Our first duty is adoration. And it's so important for us to not just realize this, but to live this. To be souls of adoration. Our primary duty, our primary purpose, to adore God. It's today harder than ever. We can say that our world is a wholesale attack on the presence of God, on the adoration of God. And so what is this, this spirit of adoration that we're after? We can describe it as an awareness of God's intimate presence with an acknowledgement of our complete dependence on him and a, an entire submission of our being to him. An inclination of everything we are to our sovereign Lord and God. An inclination like that that we make when we say Gloria and Excelsis Deo or Gloria Patri. St. Francis of Assisi would describe the soul that knows how to adore. He says such souls, they move through life with the majesty of the great rivers. My dear future priests, you're here to learn a great many things, but perhaps the most important thing that must be learned is to be a man of adoration, to live this command of the Psalms, be still and see that I am God. Vacate et videte. So I'd like this morning to take a moment to, to contemplate this, this remarkable scene as it unfolds and draw from it some of the features of a soul of adoration. And so shifting our gaze from this ruler to the author and finisher of our faith to our Lord Jesus Christ who is our way, our pattern, our example, 
We can, we can learn what it means in some small way to be a man of adoration. Jesus is in the middle of preaching to the multitudes when this incursion happens. And we're told that rising up, he followed the man. The, the soul of adoration has but one desire. My meat is to do the will of him who sent me. Whereas if we are not in God, if we're living on a natural plane, such interruptions could be frustrating. We can grow attached to our plan, our schedule, our predetermined way that we're going to spend our time and miss where the Father is calling us. But Jesus, rising up, followed him. And as they're going, the crowd is pressing upon him. He's, he's pressed on every side. A woman, an unfortunate woman, is reaching to touch his garment. And there's so much that's remarkable about this instance what I simply like to take a moment on is how our Lord handles himself with what we could see again with the eyes of nature, carnal eyes, what would be a mild annoyance. He's already being jostled. There's, she's reaching out, trying to touch him. He has somewhere he needs to be. And yet there's so much to learn from our Lord stopping, pausing, asking, acknowledging. We can say to our Lord, there's no such thing as a crowd. There are only individuals. And he takes, he takes time. Who touched me and yes there's a conversation but at the end of the day he's taking time to to give to this woman this unfortunate forgotten woman whom we so easily might have seen as annoy another interruption be of good heart daughter The reverence with which he treats this soul, this least of souls according to the, the carnal man, the reverence. He knew more than any what she was worth. He would know all too painfully because it's his very life. It's the beloved son of his father sent to save this one. And so he does not brush her off. He's not in a hurry. He takes time. Because to the soul of adoration, everyone is tremendously sacred. And especially the most unfortunate. The least passing encounter could be 12 years of disappointment, suffering, agony, as with this woman. No two immortal souls, said Aguirre Lagrange, cross paths by chance. And so our Lord continues, and he arrives at the house of the ruler where the daughter has died. And the multitude is there mourning, making a din. And our Lord enters and demands that the multitude, the crowd, the noise be removed. Put them out. Something 
sacred is about to happen. This demands silence. Our life, our life as consecrated souls, as the religious of God, is soaked in the sacred. There's nothing that's not sacred. Further, we could say our life, our mission is quite simply to, to continue what our Lord does here. Little girl, I say to you, arise. I'm coming that they may have life. Our purpose is to give life. And we will never be givers of life if we are not men of silence, men of adoration, men who are fixed in God, rooted and founded in charity. God is charity. That we may be filled unto all the fullness of God. God is. Be still and see that I am God. God in his holy place. God within. Souls, when they come with questions, are they really seeking answers or are they even more seeking God? Seeking an infusion of of this life of which we are stewards, with which we must be overflowing. It's much less about how much we know than it is about being fixed in God, rooted in God. He is the answer. I am the truth. And so, the girl, this young maiden, arises. And to all of the objections of those who say, yes, but by putting adoration first, by losing time for God in prayer, in adoration, by slowing down, by being fixed in God's life, in God, how much we lose of what we could accomplish. So much activity is necessary. After all, we're all overworked. After all, time is precious. Those who are truly effective are those who know how to adore because everything is in its proper place. Our Lord, who would spend hours in prayer, is not lost in, lost in some mystical world. No, he's perfectly one with God, and God is charity, and there's nothing more practical than charity. She rises, and our Lord says, Give her something to eat. If we are souls of adoration, our action, our charity will be of tremendous fruit. It's something tremendously concrete. Contemplation is not laziness. The world today is a lie, tells us the lie, a lie that has sterilized all too many consecrated souls. You're only worth what you produce, what you can measure, success that you can see. It's a lie. There's nothing more practical than the soul of adoration because it goes to the root of every problem excuse me to the root of the solution which is God the curé of ours a man of 
great prayer did more for an entire nation by being a man of prayer than tens of thousands of clergy alive at the same time. And so today, we contemplate this ruler who remembered his first, his primary duty before God, which is to adore. And he certainly received this grace, was taught this grace from our Lord, the source of grace. And it's going to be the same for us. We will be taught to be souls of adoration by our Lord in his great prayer, the liturgy. And so if we would learn to, to be what we must be, truly men of God, we need look no farther than the Mass, the liturgy, which tells us that nothing is small, nothing is insignificant. The least of the faithful receive an insensa receives an in insensation. The liturgy teaches the true order of things. One could say with Judas, why this waste when he sees a, a mere grain of incense, which is something expensive, simply burnt, burnt into smoke? Why this waste? And yet this, this little grain of incense accomplishes far more for God's glory because it's assumed into the prayer of the God-man. And so we must learn from the liturgy to be these grains of incense, to be lives that are, yes, wasted for God, given completely. He gives the increase if we put adoration first. Be still and see that I am God. Present yourselves as living sacrifices. Live. Whatever else, what, whether you eat or drink or whatever else you do, do all for the glory of God. The man of adoration never stops adoring. Every detail of life is taken up into this prayer. And in doing so, he will be a giver of life. Talitha Kumi, little girl, arise. It's because she was, Our Lady, because she was a soul of silence and adoration that she could receive in her womb and give to the world life himself. And so it's of her that we ask this grace, the grace truly to adore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.